<laughs> like, you know, cussing, like, uh, cursing. Okay, and we're alive. Hello, YouTube. So I am your host, Tart, and we are having a conversation today with James Cusson. I was just asking him how to pronounce his last name to make sure I had it correctly. We're going to be talking a little bit about um, the, the flip side of the coin on atheism. Uh, as an atheist YouTuber, I talk a lot about atheism, but there's also the opposite side of it, the sort of existential dread that comes from um, not having a god. Um, and we're going to talk about that and frame frame it behind Nietzsche and his famous statement, "God is dead." Um, I want to start with by introducing James. James is with is the voice of the Living Philosophy. Really great YouTube channel. If you've not had the chance to see it, it's going to be in the description. Go over there and check out his channel. He's absolutely fantastic. One of the channels that I always recommend. Welcome, James. Thank you so much for joining us. Me, I'm excited to said excited to be able to speak with you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's, uh, it's it's always exciting to to have an interesting chat. So I love I love this kind of thing, and already love your energy. So this is this is already wonderful. Awesome, awesome. So tell us a little bit about. Let, let's get started with like talking about your channel. Um, what kind of inspired you to start a philosophy channel? Where did that come from? You know, it's funny. I was only chatting to my dad about this a while ago. I I didn't. I YouTube was never a thing that I thought about. Um, it was. Yeah, I, I like always had a passion for philosophy and then psychology kind of, and the, the living philosophy really hits down on what, I, what I'm into, which is kind of uh, bringing philosophy to life. Funnily enough, since I've gotten on YouTube, that's, there's been a little bit of a, an opening up of that into a different direction. But yeah, I was making online courses, trying to figure that out. I was writing and kind of started a newsletter, started writing on Medium, and I just kept running into creative blocks. And then me and a friend of mine sat down. He was like, let's do a podcast. So we sat down and we were doing the, the psychology, kind of like a, a Jungian death psychology analysis of Irish Irish myth. Because uh, my friend would be so, yeah, he's, he's very, very like, uh, yeah, he's much more connected to the Irish tradition than I am. I'm, I'm kind of like all over the shop. But he's like, he just loved it and lived these myths since he was a kid. So we were sitting down just having chats about that. And I was like, I spend a week trying to boil one idea down and they're just pouring out of me. And then I went off hiking for 40 days. This was like just after the first lockdown in COVID and went off hiking. And just while I was out there, it was just brewing. And I was like, there's something important in that. So I was actually drawn to YouTube because of the creative process. So I came back, it was another lockdown and I did a hundred videos in a hundred days. I was like, I'm just going to like let the, because I've got all these ideas that are blocked off. It's just going to take so long for me to get through them. So I was like, let's just sit down and just figure this out. And so it was really about creative process and and the, the fact that just talking brings out ideas in a way that my writing, I was struggling with. So, and then by the end of the 100 days, I'd gotten some traction and then I'd figured out some things and I was like, I guess, I guess YouTube is what I do now. I guess this is what it is. So yeah. from there, it just, it just grew. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I've um, I've only just gotten started. My channel's a small channel, but it's just been fantastic to be able to meet awesome people who have similar interests. But my question is, why philosophy? What what drew you? To, what did you do? Did you do philosophy in school, or was it something else that drew you to do to do it specifically about philosophy? Um, so I, I studied philosophy in university, but my interest in it kind of uh, predates that. To uh, it was pretty lonely and isolated as a teenager and just got into a bit socially anxious and I just got I guess more and more isolated as, and, and unable to break out of it and I, I yeah I had this image of oh if I could just be on the far side of this chasm then I could see how things could spiral upwards but I just don't have the energy to take that step out there to begin the upward spiral I was like oh if I my brothers were working in the shop just up around the corner and I was like, oh, if I can just follow in their footsteps and do that, then I'd be in the world and I could, things would cascade forward, but I was, I just felt so stuck and just turned into like a deeper sort of depression and then kind of fantasizing about, yeah, I didn't necessarily want to commit suicide, but it seemed like an easier kind of thing to me. It, it seemed easier, it would have been easier to me if I was dead. Because I was just like, then this this would be over because I can't cross this chasm and I don't know where to go. So I was just completely stuck and kind of hit a bit of a rock bottom, had a bit of a an emotional outburst with my family, uh, which actually I think is a lot of when you really get into the psychology, it's you know the, 
we'll, we'll leave aside the, the psychoanalyzing of it, but at that point, I just there was a bit of a cathartic release, and then I was like, I'm just going to start reading again. I can't do anything, so I might as well just enjoy this time just where I am. And so I just started reading like heroes' stories, like The Three Musketeers, or Arthur Conan Doyle's Last World, and just one thing led to another, and my brother and my dad were like, oh, there's this great book called The Outsider by this French guy, Albert Camus. You should read that. And I was like, oh, that sounds cool. So I read, you know, this kind of classic existentialist novel, and I was like, this is am- like, what is this? This is, this is amazing. And when I finished it, I was like, I gotta read more of this guy. And whenever my dad had read, like, The Outsider, he'd had the same reaction, and I bought a load of Camus books. I'd gotten about two pages into the Mississippi Post, and I was like, nah, don't know like, what he's talking about, I'm good. But I picked up that book, and it, first page, first line, the only true philosophical problem is suicide. And I was like, oh, I'm home. It, I, it was just yeah. the reading where I was like, I, I read the rest of that book, and 95% of it, the first time I read it, didn't understand. But I just, I just, what I, what I did get was just this sense of I don't know what this world is, but this is it. This, yeah. this is, this is, this is the thing. This is, this is what I was searching for. And yeah, from there, I'd taken notes. There's a slip of paper somewhere with Nietzsche written on it, Zarathustra, Dostoevsky. These names he was mentioning in that book, and went off, went down the Wikipedia rabbit hole, and yeah, ended up getting some Nietzsche book from Dostoevsky and. Yeah, kind of end of story from there. The rest is history. Philosophy, exactly. Yeah, so it was uh, coming out of a dark time, just a really personal connection with it as, as a life raft. Yeah. That's that's kind of crazy because funny enough, uh, Camus was the first for me that I connected with. I didn't even know that about oh. you. And I, uh, when I was in university, I remember we, uh, we 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 were going through different readings of philosophy and stuff. And I I always found philosophy the idea of it interesting, um, but never really sat down and took the time to read any of the works. And I remember going, you know, you start with the the classics, Plato, Aristotle. None yeah. of them really hit home for me. I was just like this. Uh, it was like this is nonsense. Uh, the Platonic forms. What 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 is that? <laughs> Threw it out. Um, I, and then we got down, we got down to the modernist movement and we got up to Camus and I remember reading Camus and my professor always loved to talk, loved to ask me after the, um, after we would start talking about something and she, she was like, she said, she said my real name is Elias. She was like, so Elias, what are your thoughts? And all I said was, <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, so Camus is your, is your thing. I was like, Camus um, all the way. Camus we've gone through two, th- two and a half thousand years of the tradition. And we we should have started right. there. <laughs> <laughs> and then work the way backwards, which is funny because I, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of these writers that I found interesting at the beginning were largely um, the sort of nihilistic works. They weren't the mm. kind of works that are um, typically associated with some. I'm, I'm a realist on a lot of things and moved away from that and, you know, backtracked and actually took the platonic forms seriously eventually. Mm. Um, and then, you know, I, I don't believe in platonic forms or anything, but I still, but I went back and actually took those works much more seriously after reading uh, Camus and moving backwards for some reason worked better and for what, my mind. What was it in Camus? Was it, was it a novel? Was it a philosophical idea? Was it I can't anymore? remember which work it was specifically. I, I have this like very, I have a, I have a very spotty memory of those years of my mm. life. And I think it's, I think it's probably a, the, an issue of depression because I also suffered depression, but I remember mm. it was the topic of suicide, very similar to your, so be, um, your recollection. Well, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure it was. I can't remember because it was my first year of university. If it, if that's it's suicide, 2010. Yeah, <laughs> So we're talking. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was a long time. It's been some time ago. So it was my first year in university, but I remember that was the spark. And then my Mm. professor sent me down the the rabbit hole in reverse, and it was a very different ride for me. I took I took all the works much more seriously. Um, I ended up really enjoying it. I didn't finish that degree. I finished a few other ones. Um, I went a much more pragmatic route. A few, a few other. Yeah, I got. I I was an overachiever. (laughs) So (laughs) I just loved to. I loved schooling, and I really enjoyed it. So let's talk a little bit about specifically. Let's go into Nietzsche and what he meant by "God is dead." Um, mm. I I was watching one of your videos on this, and that's what sparked me wanting to talk to you. Was just that um, the way one the way how how expressive you are about these ideas is is just absolutely inspiring. I love the way mm. that you bring these stories to life, and that really you know echoes the, the living philosophy. You really bring them to I life. And you give um, you, you give a very different account. I think in Western in the Western world, it's really easy to just write off uh, 
Nietzsche's God is dead as he's just saying that the the traditional religions of the West are dead. It's very easy to just write it off as as that's all he's saying. Mm-hmm. Um, and in your video, you you go a little bit more into detail of what he's saying. He's saying something quite a bit bigger because he's saying something different by the word God. Um, can you go over with my audience what what is it that he's saying? What 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 is God in this statement? Yeah. So the traditional reading, I think in that video I described it as a modernist reading. So we'll say the the idea of this this atheistic secular worldview emerging, and with that. There's this modernist idea that like we kind of attribute in our mythology to Galileo of just standing up against the dogma of the church and saying, no, we will break free, we will think for ourselves. And that being a sort of a, yeah, God is dead, often standing in for that cultural place of like this, this birth of the secular world out of the dogmatic world. That's quite often how it's thrown around in the culture. But like this is this is much later. This is end of the 19th century and this is a guy at the cutting edge of, of thought and if you go into the prologue of Zarathustra or the book of Zarathustra where, where this statement comes about or maybe it's at the end of the gay science where this, he, he reuses the same material the way he talks about God is dead is Zarathustra is in the marketplace and talking about his ideas and when, he, when he's telling them that, that God is dead they're laughing at him, they're jeering at him, there's, there's a mockery, because from their perspective, they are the modernist crowd. They're not dogmatic Christians, they are secular atheists who are kind of mocking uh, the Zarathustra and Nietzsche vision of the world. But for Nietzsche, what, what he means is that God isn't... In, in the genealogy of Marx, he said that, that science is just the latest flower of the ascetic angle. It's the latest flower in, of, of Christianity rather than the opposite. It's, it's actually just the, the emergence of this, this uh, instinct for truth that was honed and developed by Christianity has just emerged into the science, but it's the same type of value system. So with God is dead, what we have is actually the collapse of our, I guess, our ontological and our ethical framework. It's the, 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 the foundation of our worldview is collapsing with God. And so there's this great passage he has where we're, we're falling through space. We don't know where it's up, where it's down. We don't know where anything, how do we take the sponge and wipe away the ocean? So it's this massive, audacious act. And he says, even at this point in the late 19th century, he's saying it's when, when, they, when they're receiving him and they're like, we don't have a clue what you're talking about. He says, this is like a star that has died a million light years away. And the light of the death of that star hasn't reached it. So we, even though we've done the act, we've killed God, but the reality of what that means hasn't struck us yet. And so you could say that with the post-truth era, with the collapse of that monolithic ontological system, and, and I guess what the postmodernists were doing, and a lot of them were Nietzscheans, especially Deleuze and, and Foucault, that they're kind of getting into looking at this, this new landscape from multiple perspectives and saying, oh, no, look, if you look at it from here and you look at it from here, there's two different realities. It's Truth is only truth from a point of view. So, and it's not like they, they were total relativists or anything, but they're just saying that the, what you think of as a, as a truth isn't necessarily a platonic ideal that like you're grasping the truth. And Thomas Kuhn would kind of follow in this, or, well, he kind of preceded this track in 1962 with the structure of scientific revolutions and the idea of a paradigm and how certain problems emerge and lose as scientific paradigms move onwards. And so you realize the truth isn't this teleological process of we're heading to truth with a capital T and science is getting a more more closely, increasingly close to the truth with a capital T. Kuhn would say that the truth is evolutionary and so it's, it's, it's a small T and we're, our, how useful what we know is with the world is, is increasing. But that's a bit of a, a sidebar, but basically to say that Nietzsche's idea that the, the, the light of the star might now be reaching us. And, and we might now be beginning to feel the crisis of nihilism that comes with the death of God as our value system, as, as the, the grounded monolithic Western value system, rather than as this particular Christian God idea, dogma, Christian God in the sky. Um, 
Yeah, I think uh, I think there's a there's a that, there's a habit, particularly on uh, on the atheist side of things. Again, I'm on that side, but there is this strange habit to think of God as the the sky daddy, um, this overly mm. simplistic. Um, when when we read, you know, Nietzsche's his words there, we we just think, oh, sky daddy's dead, and that's not mm. what he's saying. He's saying something much deeper that truth is dead. I remember. I, I don't know if you were ever religious. That's I like, was. you know, formulated in the video that truth is yeah, the truth is dead. That's truth the, is the idea dead. of the truth is the capital T. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was a fantastic video. Um, but I, I don't know if you were ever religious. I know I was, and I was I was brought up in a very religious household, and uh, there was this moment of coming out of religion that I experienced this severe existential dread because even though mm-hmm. Camus was the first one that really like um, hit home with me, and I I didn't realize I had certain leanings in that in, in directions that weren't necessarily Christian uh, sort of uh, views. At the same time. As I was coming out of the religion, I remember experiencing this this horror, this like, oh my god, I'm gonna die, and then there might not be anything after that. And having well, I, this, at what like, age would you have been when this when this happened? I was in my I I want to say like maybe mid or early mid twenties, somewhere in there was when this was happening. And how long um, of a time period did it take place over? Uh. Uh, years. It was a very. It was. It was years that I that I was going through this. Uh, kind of this journey out of religion and philosophy mm. was sort of. You know, philosophy has always been treated as the handmaiden to religion, but yeah. for me, it was the opposite. It was. It was the. It was the hand that led me out of the fog of religion for me. Mm. Um, and but getting out of it was not fun. It was not bright. Mm. It was not happy. It was terrifying, and coming down to like, well, how do we account for things like morality? How do we count? What is what does it mean for some Something to be true. Um, what are the foundations of our ontology? Right. Exactly. It was, kind of, and that existential dread that he felt, I can so deeply relate to because I experienced it firsthand, and it threw me for a huge loop. I went into a big depression during that time period because of it. Mm. Um, that's so, incredible. Because that, I actually think that that's that's much closer to what Nietzsche experienced than what I personally experienced, because I. Yeah, I, I remember from, from a young age, like even so, obviously Ireland, very, very Catholic country. Uh, with my first communion, I remember going to my mom before and going, I don't think I believe in any of this Jesus stuff. And she was like, you won't get any money if you say that. And I was like, I'm a believer. <laughs> Sign me up. So it was just, for me, I was, and I've always actually, it, it's interesting the, the way I relate to dominant culture versus minor culture. I grew up in what felt like the, the the most heard voice was the Catholicism, but I was like the fact, you know, I, I was really I was an atheist from a young age, like very much into evolutionary theory, into the, the world of science and of reading Stephen Hawking, and just really being in that state of awe at at creation. But but never it never got a hold on me. Basically, Christianity never got a hold. So. The, the nihilistic crisis is, is more, I guess, moving in, living in a zeitgeist of, of meaninglessness rather than having that sharp divide. But if you look back at Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Heidegger, they all grew up in medieval world. They, 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 they kind of grew up, what, what made them such great philosophers in that sense, I think, in, in, in diagnosing that nihilistic crisis was that they grew up, they had the loss. They, they were fundamentally religious people. Mm-hmm. And then it was ripped away from them. So even Heidegger had that in the, in the, in the early, 20, or I guess, late 19th, early 20th century of, of studying theology and, and, and was very like deeply religious and then corrupted by moving to the, to the big city. And, and these ideas kind of, kind of shook him out of it. Now, it ends up being very mystical. But same with Kierkegaard, very uh, theologically oriented and, and has that struggle, still much more in a Christian context. And Nietzsche, his father was a pastor, was a very religious kid and thought about uh, theology in his own way, but then also had it ripped away. So I, I think there's something about that personal experience of that loss and that depression and that nihilism that, that really gave birth to a level of thought that I think it's harder for us who are who grow up in the, in the cultural stew of an already nihilistic culture, you don't have that loss to appreciate how Nietzsche could come to that perspective. How how yeah. it could seem so catastrophically dangerous when I guess for me, like I can relate to it through, you know, the, my own struggles, but I never had that sense of 
I imagine you can get what he means. You, I, I bet you can see that all of it's slipping away because you felt that existential grief, that, that, that ripping away from you, the word of change. Yeah, I, I, I've i always said, actually, um, that if you haven't gone through at least one existential crisis but while reading philosophy, you just haven't read enough philosophy yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one of my big one of my big takeaways from it is that I've had so many like existential moments where I had to think, oh my, like it had I had to reformulate, rethink everything from the ground up. Like my entire my entire view was collapsing in front of me. And I, I know that a lot of atheists, uh, particularly on YouTube and other, other locations, tend to try to proselytize atheists, and that's not my mission. Um, mm. And part part of that is because I don't want anyone else to be thrown into that kind of existential dread. That's I do think God doesn't exist. I actually think, I think that he doesn't. But I don't necessarily want everyone to believe that because I think I think atheists have a tendency to um, to undervalue uh, the role, the pragmatic role that the sacred things play in the world. And I think yeah. that one of the big underscores, one of the big underpinnings that I, that I took from Nietzsche was um, that there is this notion of the sacred. There's this, the, the transcendental, there's the othered, right? And and, and with that, when you once you lose that and you just kind of look at the world as it is and it it really does become very empty. I think we can fill the world. I, I I'm with the I'm with, I'm not an, I'm not not a pessimist. I think we can fill mm. the world with meaning, and we can ascribe our own meaning. We can come to like more like, um, we we can come up with our own purpose in life, and that we don't rely on God for that. But at the same time, there's still that dread that comes with that void that you're looking into, right? And mm. you talk a little bit about how Nietzsche stares into that void, and he still has an, an air of positive uh, of positivity about him, despite looking in into this sort of black hole of what yeah. do we do next? Um, how do we, well, how do we, that's a how mad do we, Nietzsche vision. <laughs> yeah. What is it? It's a mad Nietzsche vision of it's, it's his thing is all about life affirmation and just saying yes to life, no matter what, uh, no matter what shit you go through, this is, you got to have this a- appetite for life. And that goes all the way back to his first book, the birth of tragedy. And he's comparing the Apollonian mode and the Dionysian mode in ancient Greek culture, how, uh, ancient Greek philosophy emerged out of the, the interplay of these forces. Uh, well, Greek tragedy emerged out of it, and, and subsequently uh, Greek, Greek philosophy emerged out of Greek tragedy. And so this trying to get back, always trying to get back to that tragic view of the world is Nietzsche is holding the, the deep meaningfulness and, and affirmation of suffering that was in those great ancient Greek tragedies. And so it's that that almost intoxicated, drunk Dionysian kind of love of life and lust of life, rather than this Apollonian seeking of transcendence and truth and order, Nietzsche is kind of like, let's go into the chaos. Let's just get filthy with with our instincts and just be fully fucking alive. Of course, the man didn't drink and the man never had sex, and despite the, the rumors of the, the syphilis coming from prostitutes. But, Not really um, alive. What do you think about? <laughs> if you're not drinking, well, you're not having sex. I mean, hey. <laughs> I, I still I, I I think he was so intoxicated though with there's a there's a there's a drunkenness on archetypal meaning that that you can see it, Nietzsche is, is is way more passionate and way more alive in that in that written form than most of the people I've seen out drinking who are kind of just playing a an ordered status game and are very careful even in their drunkenness until they get too drunk and then they, they lose the game yeah. <laughs> and, and become obnoxious and then make fools of themselves. But there's a there's still this, this one upmanship that's very much aware of the pecking order and this straitjacket of the of the cultural order that's around the the intoxication in our society. Whereas Nietzsche is like where where he is at the very edge of, of the intellectual tradition in the nineteenth century is he's drunk. And I, I think he's it's so he's so wrong in so many ways, but it's so provocative. You know, yeah. it's so it's so he, he thinks so differently to almost anyone else that you read that you can agree with him or you can you can disagree with him on almost everything, but you'll come away thinking. You know, if, if he questions axiomatic things that you just took for granted, and you're like, oh, what if that could be different? What if you know, truth from a point of view? Uh, every truth is from a point of view. He says that in in uh, the genealogy of of, of morals, and you're just like, what does that mean? I can. How can truth? That was that was where truth first got toppled for me. Where I was like, is is objective truth not a thing? I guess you can't have this perspective where you're looking from anywhere. You always have to be looking from a particular point at something. So it's just you you can come away disagreeing, 
but you'll always come away enriched and and that's just the drunkenness in him and so there's something of coming through a Jungian lens a, there's, there's an archetypal thing going on there there's, there's a god alive in Nietzsche that he's tapping into there's most of, most of the rest of us don't have any contact with or, or only sparse uh, contact with I think it's very it is very easy especially in philosophy to just read the writers that you agree with and mm. ignore the ones that you, do, you don't agree with and that was an amateur mistake I like I said I made that mistake mm. I was I completely dismissed pe- incredible writers like Plato initially having read their mm-hmm. works and looked at them and, um, as my professors you know pre- standing up in front of this class you know presenting it to 200 people I'm sitting here going this is nonsense this is ridiculous <laughs> what are we talking about I was sitting there going this is this is lunacy you think it can has this special form and it's out there and it's in this you know yeah. realm of form. What on earth are you talking about? And then <laughs> you know, after after re- going backwards through the traditions, it started making a lot more sense actually in reverse to me. Mm, um, and I took those true. positions so much more seriously as a result. And there are writers like I could I, I could I, I I can't think of almost anything um, at this point that I agree with some writers on. Mm. And yet I still go, oh my god, these men were brilliant. Uh, just that, yeah. just that awe at what they were able to accomplish. I want to talk about something you touched on, and we didn't, uh, we didn't get to go into it. Uh, just a moment ago, you were talking. It sounded like you were aiming at it, anyways. It's called the uh, um, the aesthetic, the aesthetic ideal, mm-hmm. um, and how. If, if if you're correct, like you were in your video, you're talking about how science is just the new face to that aesthetic ideal, where mm-hmm. there's um, essentially science is sort of being placed on the pedestal that god has previously occupied and i think that this is a mistake by atheists as well i'm i'm um i i I actually see this as a as a major issue is that um there there are a lot of philosophers i think you mentioned kuhn earlier uh, that talk about paradigm shifts where over time uh, we may, maybe there's a better process for finding truth and understanding knowledge will that then occupy the space of god um what 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 do you he talk, you were talking about like scientism? What do you take mm. scientism to be? Can you maybe cover that for us really quick? Yeah, I guess like continuing through that Nietzsche lens, you could go back to that idea of the ascetic ideal and the ascetic ideal. She's saying this is so genealogy. Morality he's talking about the difference between slave morality and master morality, and slave morality embedding this idea of evil and these these polarities and uh, inverting the value system. So rather than you know, rather than returning someone slaps you, you slap them back. Well, you can't do that if you're the slave. Otherwise, you know, their their power is so much more. So you make humility or forbearance a, a virtue, and you say, turn the other cheek, and then you've you've won. You've taken the power in that situation within this inverted value system. So these kind of aesthetic pulling back from life, rather than the impulsive instinctual thing, which is to you know deck the person back or to get your revenge, rather than living out these instincts we dam up the instincts and the aesthetic ideal is the is the saying no to life and, and pulling back and, and, and really pulling those boundaries in. And out of that come our our great with we'll the actual age religions. Uh whereas if you look back to the Bronze Age religions, you can see the Homeric uh the Iliad, the Odyssey, there's a much more master morality that's going on there. By the time you get to the actual age you've got the like Buddhism and Christianity and, or sorry, Buddhism and we'll say the, the prophets around Jeremiah, Christianity being a, a later outgrowth of the actual age. And then you've got Greek philosophy and they're very much more about controlling yourself, knowing yourself, and it's much more about withdrawing into yourself. And out of that comes this, uh, the, the monotheistic revolution and, and, and this transcendental world rather than just this world. Because master morality can live in just this world with its instincts. But aesthetic morality says there's another world that's superior to this world. And in that world is God, and here's actually God's rules. It's a slave morality, so you got to live by these rules. And so fast forward, what, uh, 1,500 years, 2,000 years, and the cracks begin to appear in that, and we begin to take off the clothes of, of the, the aesthetic ideal, and, and it's, in, in the West it gets stripped back down to science. So God, you take away a lot of the, the daddy in the sky stuff, and you're left with, this truth, this transcendental, the real world out there, the thing in itself, the thing outside of us, as it is in reality. So this is where Nietzsche's point of the, where are you looking at this real world, this thing in themselves? You're just imagining yourself outside your skull looking at the world as it is, but that's that's just another perspective. And you're like, how, there, how can you get a sense of that? And you, 
if you really think about it enough, you're going back to Parmenides and Heraclitus and Parmenides' idea that everything is one. That every, like, how can you divide what B is? Because it's just one ultimate B. And, and because if you're getting outside of your perspective, then everything just is. And, and, and separation requires a consciousness, which is a, a division. But anyway, so science is this with truth emerging and, yeah, as, as a denuded version of, of God. And then it's, yeah, triumphantly dancing on the grave of, of Christian God as if it's something completely different and then holds up. And then you've got all these fucking debates between atheists and, and, and Christians or Muslims. And it's, it's just like... What, what are you doing? Like you're 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 filled with this passion, and, this, I, and I had a I had a big animus against uh, Dawkins. So my atheism phase kind of ended around 17, 18, around the same time I discovered philosophy. Funnily enough, that took me away from atheism rather than deeper into it. Yeah, um, it can take you in both directions, can't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what that's what's fun about philosophy. You, you never know where it's going to take you. <laughs> just put your worldview in a blender, and you don't know what's going to come out. Uh, but, <laughs> no clue. Yeah, I had this animus towards Dawkins because I was just like, you're so you're so passionate, you're so angry, and you're so preachy about this shit. And it's just, it's it's called it a delusion and this, this mind virus, and we need to basically eradicate it. This is, this is the, the utopian direction we're headed in. And it just be this, uh, this this line from a spiritual writer comes to mind that I, he's actually saying it about a Christian, but uh, he says, uh, your eagerness betrays you. And I think that there's something in that, that need to preach, that need to, get up on your soapbox, but, but it's just like, I feel like you got a lot more skin in this game than there's, there's an idolization of something scientific going on here as if there's something more to it. I remember going to a 10-day meditation retreat and afterwards having this, this argument with someone who's used, an atheist who was just saying, no, no, the, the, the scientific method is this universal thing that would be discovered on any planet. And it's this almost universal law it's beautiful it's, it's i was like this, this is it's just not that's just that's I was just, just like false. that's such a weird uh it's it, it, it wasn't even the point he was making it was the the language it was wrapped in yeah it, it, like the point is false the, this, as well the, but it's science also this, is the capital t truth in his yeah. mind rather than like i, I think uh, you know i i have to correct people often on this topic when it comes to science about how you know you, you have science is just it's really two terms you've got the you've got the uh, the method, the methodology that leads to mm-hmm. the knowledge, and then you have science that is the body of knowledge produced by that method, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think there's a there's a tendency to to idealize and place that body of knowledge on that pedestal by atheists, and I think this is a mis- this is a severe mistake mm-hmm. because a lot of these things, like if you take if you take the skeptics seriously, for instance, the scientific anti realists who are going to be skeptical about um, the existence of like non observables, so uh, items that are too small for us to actually interact with like atoms you might think that there's some reason to to think these things aren't they don't actually look the way that we make them look instead this is like a structure that we use to make predictions about things but it's it's at least Mm. feasible and possible that these that these entities these too small to see entities um aren't the way that we've constructed them. They aren't the way that we look at them. And for no. a long time, I was of that view. Yeah. And we, we, yeah. We, we just have a model in which we're like, this is reality. This is, this is what the tech would say. This is truth. And it's like, well, it's a, it's a, a very good model of the world, which is kind of Kuhn's point. But then exactly. You it is. Like, it's a great model. Not, yeah, not like, shitting on science. <laughs> it's, and it's, but this, it does a disservice to science to see it as something that's fixed in stone rather than something that can continually evolve rather than, you know, the, the paradigm shift from with the Newtonian worldview of like static space into uh, uh, an Einsteinian uh, time space uh, continuum. But then you've got someone like Carla Ravelli coming along, and I, I don't want to completely betray my complete and utter ignorance of quantum mechanics, but he's saying that things, well, rather than seeing a, a universe of things, uh, quantum, the quantum world should be understood as uh, flows and, and processes as. as more as something in motion and dynamic rather than as rather than a substance based uh, ontology uh, a more process based ontology i guess so what if reality isn't uh, the solid things the table the lamp the, the, the monitor but more things in process that we tell narratives about so how do you kind of getting back to thesis of ship of how do you know you're the same person as yesterday other than by telling a story and it's, it it doesn't really make sense from a from a, a substance ontology, how to how to really 
you're getting into deep philosophical waters with that, but my point is more that it's, it's possible to even conceive of the physical world completely differently to the way science does now. It's like si substance-based way of looking at things is, I think, a very helpful way for science to begin because you get to separate and atomize things and separate them off from the world and study them in isolation. But you pick anything up, uh, you pick anything up, the, the naturalist John Weir had this line, that you pick anything up and you find this hitch to everything else in the universe. You go, okay, yeah. so this thing, it's made of these elements, and these elements have come from a supernova that was there, and then that, you know, that takes us back to the Big Bang. And well, if you listen to Roger Penrose, the Big Bang was actually just the, the emergence out of a black hole in a different universe. And so there's this turtles all the way down of like, where, where does it actually begin? So a more cyclical vision of reality rather than this, uh, this yeah, this, this more Christian idea of the, of the Big Bang. Because I don't know if you've heard about that, uh, that guy. Back when the Big Bang Theory was first, yeah, it was, was an insult. Bang. It was it was a joke yeah. about calling it the Big Bang. Was it was just a joke? It was like it's yeah. oh, there's this Big Bang, and it's like well, and then it just stuck, and everyone went with it. Now we I literally think, call it the Big Bang. I, I, I think the guy joke. was Fred Hoyle. Uh, that might have been his name. He was or Sir Fred Hoyle. That he was, uh, I think, the head astronomer in in the UK, and was just like because George Lemaitre was the guy that came out with the the Big Bang Theory. And he was just like, this is just importing, or Fred Hoyle said, this is just importing a religious concept into science. And he died around 2002, 2003, and he still didn't believe in the Big Bang. He still held Really? It. Yeah. So I, 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 think, that. It, I think it was uh, Max Planck that said, science progresses one funeral at a time. <laughs> yeah. the, the, old, the old paradigm doesn't, like, everyone doesn't go, oh, you're right. It kind of takes, it's the, it's the grad students and the, and the undergrads that kind of pick up, oh, there's a change in the wind, and then they mature into it. If you had a mortal scientist, it would probably be very bad for science because it wouldn't be able to evolve. But, yeah, it was, it was just this interesting idea of, like, the Big Bang was conceived as this, no, no, you're bringing religion into science. Yeah. And it's interesting because it fits so neatly with the Christian view of there's a beginning and an end, which isn't a common metaphysical uh, narrative. And then if you look at Roger Penrose, who he came up with the, big, uh, with the black hole theory with, with Stephen Hawking, his uh, hypothesis now or theory is that the universe is it's, it's cycle so it's actually a cyclical thing that this is born out of a black hole in another universe which is born out of a black hole in another universe so it's this ongoing thing the big bang was at the beginning and so we're now looking at more of an indian cosmology of the of this the cycle. Of time and some yeah. kind of like yeah and so it's, it's even with science and keeping up to date with science your ontological thinking completely shift between one century and another it's it's the thing is constantly in evolution and so to say that this is the truth of the world yeah you can knock the sky daddy of, of the, the judeo-christian tradition but to think that science knows exactly what's going on in the world rather than having as Kuhn would say an increasingly useful and uh instrumental model of the world it, it, it's growing increasingly good at predicting things in the world and understanding the world but that doesn't mean it's still a model a model is yeah. always wrong but sometimes it's useful um, and I think it's healthy to always be skeptical about those kinds of models, right? Like I think um, it, it's a testament to science, the, to the success of science, that we have ended up um, ide 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 idealizing. Yeah. There's the word I'm looking for. I was trying to get it out of my. <laughs> we've been idealizing science. It's it's a testament to its success that we've idealized it that way. Um, mm. But at the same time, I, I don't I don't think it's wise to just take this very. Um, science is God view. And I think that oftentimes this ends up being even being positioned, particularly by hardline, uh, hardliner views on, on, on cons in conservatism. They'll, they'll oftentimes pit Christianity against science. And then some will try to um, blend the two. And there's all these, like, um, there's some, there's some strange ways in which atheists will do this too. They'll try to say, mm -hmm. Oh no, there's, there's science. And then there's religion. It's like, it's not exactly true. There, there is, this is the other side of the coin. Maybe it's the case that science, that, that religion was the first science. So there was something about the world that it was telling us some success that it had about the world mm -hmm. in some way. Maybe it produced a better culture, a better society or something like believing that there's a God out there could potentially, you know, make it to where people are less likely to commit commit tons of crimes, or maybe it was useful in war scenarios. There's all, all sorts of pragmatic values. And even sociologically, we could not have science without Christianity because yeah. 
there's, there's this myth in scientism that Galileo challenged, like Copernicus Galileo, they challenged the dogma of, of the church. Of the church, that that's is, not exactly true. <laughs> that's not true. That's not what happened. Really, if you want to look at the birth of the scientific revolution, you go back to the 12th century Renaissance, or back to the 8th century Carolingian Renaissance with uh, Charlemagne bringing the, the monks over from Ireland, who were the only place that ancient Greece was still uh, extant in, in Western Europe and, and creating these, these cathedral schools. And then you fast forward to 12th century. These cathedral schools have founded the first universities. You have the Arabic culture in the Iberian Peninsula in Spain. The knowledge that they've brought, they've saved Aristotle. Uh, and so all these works of Aristotle, but not just Aristotle. You have Avicenna and Averroes who have taken Aristotle and moved it along. So they've moved his work of optics along. They've moved the, the science elements of Aristotle along and are, are following that quest for knowledge. Then that tradition kind of fades. The Reconquista happens in Spain and all of these writings get brought up to, to France and England and into these universities. And there was a pope who died in the, I think the 12th or 13th century. He died in his optics lab. Like he was, there were, there were all, deeply involved in the scientific program. And if you look at the Renaissance, it was a fucking non-entity as far as science is concerned. If you go through, we'll say, the, the height of the Renaissance from 1450 up to 1550, nothing happens until 1600. Like the, the beginning of the 17th century is when the scientific revolution really continues. And that's really thanks to the optics innovation that allow, well, we'll say the telescopes to emerge. And that optics scientific revolution is built on the earlier scientific revolution of the, that's what century Renaissance, those optics of the, the Arabic philosopher, scientist, and then the early Christian in the universities, like that Pope, these, these early scientists, they're, they're the ones that developed the, the optics and, and were developing the theological worldview, challenging it, bringing Aristotle in, having these, these debates, deconstructing that, that scholasticism and, and moving into creating space for the emergence of this scientific revolution. The Renaissance was fantastic for art. But it did fuck all as far as science is concerned. And yet we look back and we go, the Renaissance is the rebirth of the age of the classical culture. It's just like Petrarch was a great fucking marketer, but like as far as the Renaissance goes, it didn't contribute to the scientific, the scientific revolution. It was a fantastic artistic revolution. It creates a great narrative of the emergence of that ancient mindset, which you see in works like Carl, Carl Sagan's Cosmos. He's like, yes, this is the reemergence. Oh, if only those ancients had continued their scientific work. It's like, well, it, it did continue. The education was gone except for these Christians because, uh, as Max Weber talked about, the, the, these ethical prof prophetic religions like uh, Christianity or, or Islam put a great em emphasis on education because, call it indoctrination, but they, they want to make sure that the, their people understand the, the, the prophecies so that they can reach salvation. And it's through that sociological process of these particular religions that education is emphasized, even when the Roman Empire crumbles and you have this chaos, education survives. And so you get the emergence of the, the sociological foundations that can lead to a rebirth of the culture. But it's got nothing to do with the fucking Renaissance. And Galileo is his own bit of a fucking hack. So this is this <laughs> mythology that has developed in scientism to like completely demarcate religion and science. And it's a complete fucking fabrication. And it's pretty frustrating. There's a mistelling of but, there's a there's a total mistelling of history, especially like I love that you bring up Galileo because I think um a, a lot of atheists will point to the story of Galileo as if as if it was a story of science versus the church, and that's not exactly what happened. It's just a yeah. misrepresentation. Like what happened was Galileo he he did he did you know find that hey the Earth is not the center of our solar system, the sun is. But what got him in trouble wasn't that. What got him in trouble was trying to interpret the biblical texts to be – to say it to, in a specific way yeah. to sort of write that out of it. But that's the role of the Catholic Church in their view, and that's why they arrested him, not to say that's any better. Like, science, I don't, I don't think the Church should have that power. But. Yeah. He, was a, he was an absolute celebrity at first. He was invited to the Vatican to present his findings. He was given fantastic, luxurious – and it seems like he was a bit of a – other people had done the work before him. Anyway, but Galileo isn't such a isn't such a saintly. He's not the person you want to build your mythological Promethean enterprise on. But yeah, especially when it but comes somehow to history it. wrote him as the hero, and yeah. I, he he he's a hero in a lot of ways. I, I'm not under I'm not undermining no, the but, fact that he was an interesting scientist. He had a lot lot to say that was really great. But I think that the 
the the the myth the that prevails, yeah. the narrative is just completely just a an utter misrepresentation of what actually happened. Yeah. And, and I think when, I think the term you've put on it, myth, is actually what's significant there because yeah. there is a a a narrative a, like a, a mythic narrative of scientism of this is the mythology. This is our mythos. We've emerged from the dark ages. And we have brought the light of knowledge and science and truth. And Galileo, oh, we challenge it's the Promethean challenge to the darkness, to the to the ignorance. We've stolen light from the gods, and it's just, it's it's just frustrating because of the hypocrisy of the you don't know what the fuck you're talking about historically, and so it's embarrassing for a lot of like atheistic culture where you're just like, oh, the 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 dripping arrogance of it coming out of this, and yet the ignorance of its own history, the ignorance of how it's actually a further development and Nietzsche's point is actually quite accurate there rather than a revolution breaking away. And yeah. It's, and it's, I, I, I do love, I do love the success of science and I admire the work of these people. Yes. I think that it's this arrogance, this birth from the, it's more like a, I, I think it's more of a, a misconception of the average folk, the average, the average atheist, the average person who's just dealing with the world goes, Oh, but science says, and, um, uh, there's a there's a lot of statements that they're saying that they're just plain out wrong about like they're 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 misunderstanding things mischaracterizing what scientists are even doing yeah. um but they just put they put this thing on the pedestal and there's there's an irony to the fact that you've made a new god is all you did you've made this sacred and you've abandoned the sacredness of god in yeah. the past sure you've ab- you've abandoned that quote unquote truth and now you have another one that you've placed on the same pedestal in the same place, and it's a, it's an utter hypocrisy. And I love the the framing in your video um, about this, where you're talking about how you know typically the atheist is jeering and laughing at the theist, um, but Nietzsche is sort of pointing the finger back, going, "But hey, wait a minute." You're also putting something on the pedestal, and you're jeering and <laughs> laughing, at, and you, it's your own hypocrisy that's that's humorous. Um, I, I absolutely love the way you frame it in your video yeah. about that. It's just it's a fant- it's really fantastic. I must go video. back and watch it. I, I, I was quite proud of that one. I, I it's been about like two the, years you know? since that one. Yeah, it's been about yeah. two years. It's a good one. I really, I mean, it was like well, I think maybe like seventeen minutes. I was captivated the entire time. I was like, <laughs> I was like, this is great. This is like. Um, because it's, it's more of a postmodern to modern rather than a modern to traditional, you know? It's, yeah, it's exactly. a postmodern critique of modern society rather than a modern critique of traditional society. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that I love that reverse the, the reverse nature for some reason just really speaks to me and so it's mm. like it's a it's a it's a it's a big point in my life that um that it really harkens back to. Um yeah. and, and I think I had... just just to close that, like you uh, you you did say something there of like the the way it's understood in, in a lot of mainstream atheistic culture. And I've, I've been watching through. Have you heard of ContraPoints? Uh, I have. Yes, yes. Yeah, I've yeah. heard of ContraPoints. I'm watching through ContraPoints' videos from the start at the moment. She deleted a lot of them, but the, they're on archive.com. And there's one where she was doing a critique of feminism. It's maybe her like ninth or tenth video, and she's saying, like, you know, there's, there's, there was a lot of at that time. This was like 2016. There was a lot of atheistic culture was going against SJW culture. That was kind of the the loggerheads of the, the YouTubers of atheists and culture going against us. And she was kind of talking about the critiques of feminism, like someone would send her something of like, look, here's a feminist doing a stupid thing, therefore feminism is defeated. She's like, of course, most people are stupid. Like 97% <laughs> of most people that are feminists, they're just, they're just talking something that's complete nonsense that is not actually intellectually rigorous at all. And that's true of most movements. And I think that that applies to the atheistic thing as well, that there is really good and rigorous atheists. There is a, a really solid interaction with science. There's very intellectually developed scientific philosophies of science. But it's just the it's the idolatry that happens at a mass level that that is that is questionable. So yeah, I, I don't want to like slam it's a, all, it's all a all common atheism, person thing uh, rather yeah. than a. It's not it's not to say anything about the the scientists themselves or the individuals who are you know participating in this at a, at a, an academic academic level these mm. people are are some of the most brilliant minds in the world and they're doing some amazing work and their work has like huge effects like we've our mm. our, our everyday life has improved massively so there is there is a way in which i sort of venerate them in, in, in like in my admiration of them mm. but at the same time i i understand their limitations i think there's a there's a habit of atheists also to mock um the 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 value that things like philosophy have in terms of these kinds of concepts yeah. as well 
that there's a, you know, if I'm talking about philosophy, a lot of atheists are like, well, why are you doing that? Why not just talk about science? And it's like, well, science is a, is, it's, it's sort of a, it came from philosophy. It birthed from the yeah. empiricist movement. And it's like, why would I only, why would I only focus on that one? I think that it's at least possible in the future. We may come up with a methodology that is even better at producing knowledge than the scientific method is. Um, and if, and if, and when that happens, I'm going to, you know, go, by science, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna go over to this. I'm gonna go over to this thing, whatever that is. And science is constantly improving. It's like a procedure. It's a process that we have um, developed over time, and we've honed it, and we've gotten better and better and better at that procedure. Um, mm. And yes, but it's really it's a, it's, it's a child of of philosophy. Really, like if you go back to Newton, you know, you had your natural philosophy, and that's kind of these sciences all got hived off from philosophy as as they developed. Yep. Into, into that methodology. So I guess the last ones would be something like sociology or psychology in the late 19th century, early 20th century. These were the latest hiving off. And so philosophy is kind of what's left over when all these other fields have kind of gone off into their own. But there's... there's the yeah, birthplace like, of all of our modern things, mathematics, science, history, uh, sociology, uh, psychology, all of that. The birthplace like, oh, of that was, was yeah. with philosophy. It's the, it's, the, it's the foundations of all of those things. And a lot of people just completely go, ah, we don't need that. You don't yeah. need the foundations of things. Yeah, <laughs> You're going to build a house without a foundation. <laughs> the, argument, the argument might be you can, you can dispense with that because it's a historical relic. Okay, that's, that's nice. We can look back to the shamanic tradition, to the religious tradition. To philosophy, these are all outdated things that led to where we are, which is science. But I, I still don't think that that's true because I, I, I see philosophy as studying the things that, yeah, you're not going to be able to point to an accumulation of knowledge. But I think that philosophy is really shaping what world we live in. Like the, the, the idea that we live in a materialist uh, reality that we should study empirically because everything is, it surfaces, everything is just external stuff and the mind is actually just what's happening in the brain that's emerging out of enlightenment era philosophy you know this isn't an inherent way this is a particular ontology that is not the and carlo rovelli's way of looking at the world is a different ontology it's, it's a different way of understanding the world and so the idea that philosophy is dead is kind of this arrogance of like yes this materialist ontology is all that there is and this will you know endure forever and and yes it, it just it, it baffles me, but I we saw... take it as a given. We take it as a given that the world yeah. is physical, and that's not the that's not the true picture of the way that people in the past saw the world. Uh, you can see, like in the in the idealist movements, particularly you know, uh, you look back to, to Berkeley and you know the mm. the Kantian era. Those, those sorts of the way that they saw the world was so drastically different than this sort of uh, physicalist paradigm that we we're living in now. That's a that's a very new thing. Now a, a high you need to portion go, you need of to go our back to the, yeah the, the quantum physicists Planck, uh, Schrödinger, like I, like going back to Einstein, like that early twentieth century. Oppenheimer, these guys had wacky worldviews. These guys were coming up with very interesting, unusual metaphysical ways of looking at the world, which were, they were very steeped in philosophy and they were very much pushing the metaphysical boundaries because they were thinking about what is the world. It wasn't obvious to them, especially coming out of the, the quantum tradition, that, that it is just a materialist uh, world. They were kind of exploring much, much more. Uh, so there's, there's an arrogance of the, the, that the giants of even the 20th century didn't have no mind about, you know, obviously going back to Berkeley and, and Locke and, and, and Kant and, and the way they saw the world. And they're coming up, it's interesting that we're coming back to a lot of those ways of thought. Like if you think about, um, for, as, a, as an example, Bernardo Kastrup is, has this whole new idea mm. around um, idealism that he's, com he's coming out of like the Kantian tradition. Um, and then he talks a little bit about Schopenhauer and he thinks that there's this thing called mind at large, that the universe itself is this conscious entity and it's a type of idealism. And so he thinks what you and I are he plays off of he plays off of some some of the things from transcendental idealism. So uh, the 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 mind is going to be like it's it's going to be important for in order for there to be distinct things, there needs to be a mind, a perspective to those two distinct things. Because if you look at like Kant, space and time are not these transcendental things of that they're not transcendentally apart from us. They're aspects of our intuitions instead. And so um, if you look at the world from that perspective, and you say, well, then what does it mean for you and I to be different things. Well, there's going to be a spatial separation between us, and then there's a temporal separation. But if space and time are aspects of our intuitions instead of things in themselves, then it's going to follow that 
ultimately speaking, you and I are the same thing. And so this, uh, Bernardo Castro puts this in a, in a different way. He says that we are, um, we are uh, basically we're viewing each other across what he calls a, um, I think it's like a third person perspective. It's a it's it's a first person's perspective being viewed across um, a dissociative boundary, is what he calls it. And these mm. are very old ideas. These he's harkening back to, I mean, all the way back to like um, all of the idealist movements from like the Germanic traditions and things like that. He's coming back to some of those conclusions. And mm. in science, you mentioned earlier the the cyclical view of the universe. That one's an interesting one because we're finding that some mathematical models show that the universe could have caused itself. Um, because there can be a bending of space and time so extreme at a point, at a singular point, I mm-hmm. need the big bang that it ca- curves backwards in time and causes itself to happen. And that those things are just like mind blowing. Um, but it's, it, I, I think it's, I think it's irresponsible and I have been irresponsible in this front as well to just dismiss these other views and these other, these other past things to throw those out and pretend that they didn't have some mm. value that they brought to our world. is just uh, beyond irresponsible. And it's something that my generation, I think could learn from. I think we have a lot that we could learn from these past generations. Yeah. And I, like, so I, I think that that is where philosophy still has incredible meaning is, is, ontology and epistemology like what is what are the beings what what is the nature of this world and how do we know that we know so once once you change those dials the world you live in what science is how successful science is it all begins to look very different if you start messing with the ontological underpinnings or with the epistemological underpinnings and there's no way to turn these into sciences because there's no way to get outside of our human human perspective it's, it's all ultimately anthropocentric. Like science is always being done by humans in specific, uh, well, yeah, in, in, in specific paradigms. So you can't really get out and look at reality and make a science of, of ontology because it's, it's us trying to look at what's outside the box from, from inside. And, and that's just, and even that analogy is, is very much assuming the modernist, atheistic, materialist worldview of like, oh, there is a world outside of our heads. Yeah, it's still, it's still how, like, and this was Wittgenstein's kind of obsession was how our language shapes the way we form the world, how how we interact with the world is shaped by the language that we use about it. So he kind of talked about Augustine's innovation of, of time as a, as a river moving, and and how we now see time as having this, you know, coming from the left, this going linear, to the right, this linearity yeah. to it, and and that you can be on the on the outside of it looking in, whereas Heidegger's like, no, no, you're, you're absolutely in that we are time, we are the flow. And, and yet it's these images. We use this language in order to form a metaphorical vision of the world and then we inhabit that as if it is the world. And so you can't create a science of epistemology or ontology. The best you've got is philosophy and it's hubris to, to ignore it. Yeah, it's and that's exactly that's exactly what I think it is. I think it is hubris because it's very mm-hmm. it's it. There are entire schools of philosophy that just focus on just our perspective and what and that um. There's one that talks about um. I I, t- I spoke with a philosopher recently. He was like uh, he was saying that um. He was trying to talk about plants from their perspective, and that's a it's a mm-hmm. it's it's a play in it's a play in language. He obviously means it means it more analogously than that. Um, but talking about the way in which a plant would view the world would be entirely and utterly othered from the way in which you and I would view the world. Mm. Um, but with the, but he, when he when he talks about like consciousness, he doesn't mean like the the, the subjectivity that you and I think of. Like for instance, um, the the likeness to be that thing, right? Like that's that's the way we take the. There's a seed of experience that we have inside of ourselves. We're reviewing the world, and then there's 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 this other side to that coin. The the world, but what what would it be like to be a part of the world, but not have that seed of experience? And I don't think that we can have actually meaningfully put any anything to that. And this is this motivates some things like like external world skepticism. Those sorts of things are motivated by these kind of questions. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I find those views very interesting. I tend towards realism now. There was a time that I didn't. I tend towards realist views. I think what did you tend towards me. at that time? Um, in the past accidentally complete nihilism <laughs> like i don't know yeah. i even um even recently i was looking at there's one view ontological nihilism which is just uh a lot of people take it as being you know that there's actually nothing out there mm. and that's not exactly what they mean what they mean instead is like okay so if i take an object like if i've got i've got i've got my can here of of of, of a monster let's say i start taking away properties about this can so i take away the blackness the the metalness the the greenness and i start taking stripping away these properties um what's the thing that i'm left with when i have no properties left 
Is there mm. is there an object? Is there a propertyless object? What would that even what would that even mean? <laughs> um, and so the ontological nihilist just goes. The world is just a, a bundling of properties. It's not. It's not the case that there's any this 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 exterior external object. There are these bundling of properties that you and I experience. And but when we talk about properties, if we if we're anti-realist about properties, then we should be anti-realist about the world, right? So like if I'm not a realist about them, properties aren't out there like in the Platonic forms or something. Instead, they are uh, they're aspects of my experience. Then the whole world is aspects of my experience, and that's just like mm. mind blowing as a person. <laughs> that one's just like, whoa, wait, what? <laughs> and when we're going back to Berkeley, I mean, you know, the the, yeah. that, the whole, you know, if you're if, if you're imagining a tree in a field, you know, how do you do so without a without a without a, 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 a perspective? Ima- try to do it without a perspective. What do you imagine? Well, nothing, right? If you're if you're still imagining a tree in a field and there's not a spectator. If you're still seeing that tree in the field in your head, you're the spectator. <laughs> you're the perspective, yeah. right? Even even if you're imagining yourself outside of a body, you're still yeah. in a perspective it's still as you. if you're using your human eyes. And even the idea of the visual thing as the as the actual experience of reality is very much conditioned and you can find a human within a mile of you who's probably blind who has a completely different different way of power. looking at the world. Yeah. Yeah, we're coming up on that one hour mark. I do want to give you your time back. I I've really enjoyed this conversation. This has been oh, sensational this has been, uh, to spend yeah, time with you. Been, uh, lovely, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, I've really enjoyed it. exploring because even ontological nihilism, I've never heard of it, but it's just so there's something in that that interplay of ideas that is always just so uh, fruitful. Look into it. Take the time. I want to give you some time to tell us if you had. Do you have any projects you're working on? Anything that's coming up on your channel that maybe my viewers might be interested in? Are you working on new, new, uh, new series, new videos, anything? Uh, I'm, well, I'm going through one of those uh, existential crises you were talking about. I'm having a bit of a it's, yeah. It's, it's Yay! A, it's, I'm, I'm having some yeah. There's, there's there's nothing nothing to point to unless we're talking years in the future, and I don't know what that will be because there's just it's all emerging. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm still what I what I am, what I think, the the way I'm living is it's just still. I'm, and again, yeah, I very much sound like someone in an existential crisis right now, but it's it's transforming and and it's rare that this happens. Uh, so I'm kind of reveling in the in the really of like, oh, I don't know what's emerging. So yeah, there's nothing in particular that uh, I'm I'm I, I want to plug or anything because it's just. Let's watch this space and see what emerges. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna plugging everything into the uh in into the description so that I'll direct people to your channel as well. Uh, it's been a right. pleasure speaking you with you. I'm gonna be launching a new series soon. It's gonna be on relationships, sex, sexuality, um, those sorts of things. My first one is gonna be talking to Dr. Widows. She's gonna be coming on in two weeks. If anybody would like to join, she's gonna be talking with me about the ethics behind um, plastic surgery. Uh, so that right. that one's gonna be very interesting. I've not had the chance to talk with anyone about those topics. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to it. Is your Forever. channel on YouTube actually? Is it is it the is it these interviews or do you have a channel that's doing separate? No, doing, they, they, I do. Yeah. I do these interviews. I also do some small videos myself and things like that. So, but mm. largely, what I do is I do a lot of a lot of interviews like this, talking with people, um, just having these fantastic conversations. I also talk with. Um, I've talked with scientists. I talk with just all sorts of, of really interesting people, mm. um, and I get to do the interviews. And I've also been featured on some really awesome channels myself to be able to like talk with just just fantastic people. It's been a really great. It's been a really great journey. You have a brilliant energy for it because you're so you're so open, you. but you're also so affable. It, it's it's really uh, yeah, you, you, you're perfect. For it. it's I appreciate it. That's a huge compliment. Especially like I said, I've been a long long time fan of yours, so to, 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 to get that kind of a compliment is fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, everyone who showed up and was listening in. I we didn't get any we didn't get any questions. We got some comments from some people saying like Marco said that uh, Camus was also his first one, and it was oh, the, uh, the myth yeah. of Sisyphus. I'm like, yeah, yeah, Camus. He's, uh, he's that philosophical Chad. He's uh, taking all of our virginity in the philosophical realm, you know. Yeah, and Marco is a good friend of mine, and he I didn't know that about him, that he also oh, connected cool. with, uh, <laughs> with I, I had no idea he connected with Kemu first as well. I didn't know yeah. that, so that's interesting, because he and I have a lot in common in our views now. Oh, cool. um, let's see here, Jeet said, at the, at the edge of what we know, 
we seem as asymptomatic, we have asymptomatic values, which at least seem infinite. What is not possible? Not sure what he means there, but I, I'll ask him because I actually know him on Discord, so I'll talk with him mm. later. To everyone who showed up, thank you guys so much for watching. It's been a pleasure to be able to speak with James today. I hope everyone's enjoyed the conversation, and we'll be back on um, in about two weeks. I've got, uh, like I said, Dr. Widows will be coming on, and we'll be talking about the ethics of uh, plastic surgery. That'll be fun. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a good night.